Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome back to Iron Sharpening Iron on this rather cool Thursday in the Chicagoland area, waiting for the sun to come out. Welcome to Christy Tucker, Ethel Mitchell, Ruth Moore, Rebecca Kearns, Lucretia Love, Antoinette Ross Whitfield, Deborah Robinson, uh, Barb Tucker, and Catherine Lindsay and Sister Poole on the conference line. We are continuing in Second Peter. We may get through it tonight. If not, we remind ourselves that we never rush the word of God. So we're going to open with prayer and we're going to begin reading at 2 Peter 3.14. Father God, we come tonight and we thank you for this day, for our health and strength, for minds that woke up and were stayed on you as you kept us throughout the day and brought us to this present time. We thank you that we have opportunity via these various platforms to uh, fellowship around your word. And so we ask you now to let your Holy Spirit fall afresh on each of us open up the eyes of our understanding, challenge, encourage us to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to read, begin reading at 2 Peter, 2, no, 2 Peter 3, 14. And it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in in peace, without spot, and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written unto you. 
as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever. Amen. We closed last week reminding us that there is nothing new under the sun. People's hearts are still deceitfully wicked. And Paul told us in 2 Timothy uh, verse 3, 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And this is why all throughout the scriptures, God warns us not to be deceived. We talked about, and Second Peter is all about us becoming and preparing uh, for Christ's return, because this earth as we know it was once destroyed by water, according to Genesis 6, verses 11 through 13, because God looked down and saw that the earth was filled with violence. It was corrupt. And he said it was basically corrupt through and through. And so he destroyed earth. And as we come now at verse 14, and Peter begins to wrap up his letter, he's saying, Beloved, see that ye look for such things. What such things are we looking for? We're looking for Jesus's return. Hebrews 11.10 says, We look for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God, a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells no unrighteousness. That is what Jesus went to prepare for us. And he told us in John fourteen twenty seven, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Our lives are hid in Christ with God. And Paul tells us in Second Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You and I have the mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit, who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts, reminding us how much we are loved, putting us in remembrance of all that God has promised so that you and I not walk through this world as we hear wars and rumors of wars and famine and all of those precursors before uh, Christ returns. He wants us to enjoy peace that surpasses all understanding. Jesus is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. Verse 14 continues, therefore be diligent. There's that word again, meaning diligence, meaning all use all your energy to make every effort to redeem the time, renewing and purifying your minds and your hearts so that when Jesus returns, we will be found in peace, without spot and blameless. Verse 15 tells us to account or consider that the long suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. The reason we're still here is because there are many who are not yet in Christ. And as we said earlier in our teaching, salvation means to be open, wide, or free. By implication, it means to be safe. God is giving people time and space to repent 
from unbelief, turn away from sin and selfishness and turn to him so that they can be safe from the wrath to come when Christ returns. As believers, we are saved. Saved from what? Again, saved from the day of the Lord, the wrath to come. When we depart from this world, we go into the presence of God. And if we're still here when he returns, we'll be caught up to meet him in the air, as Paul described it in First and Second Thessalonians. But again, there are still many who need to hear and believe the gospel, because if they die without faith in Christ, they will spend eternity in hell away from the presence of God, no longer experiencing his goodness, his mercy, and his grace that right now the scripture says shines on the just and the unjust. Verse 15 continues. Peter says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Peter acknowledges that God had given his fellow apostle Paul great wisdom. And he says in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, referring to the epistles that Paul wrote, that he was also speaking of these things, of Christ's return, of his life, his death, resurrection, ascension, and soon to return. He says some of the things that Paul wrote were hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. The word rest means to picture as a wrestler in a wrestling match. When a wrestler is in a wrestling match, he's twisting and turning back and forth with his opponent. Peter says the unlearned and the unstable are those who do not study to show themselves approved of God. They are these false prophets, teachers, and preachers that we talked about, the falsies who pervert the word of God, twisting and turning it, taking it out of context to make it say what they want it to say. And he tells us, don't listen to them because they are not on a firm foundation. They are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. James told us, if any of us like wisdom to ask of God who give it to us liberally and does not scoff at us or make us feel small because we ask for wisdom. He said, let us ask in faith. But if we waver, we're like the wave of the sea tossed to and fro, and that person will not receive anything from God because he is unstable in all his ways, halting between two opinions, God and man's. Some of their false heresies are there is no heaven or hell. And another, God is loving and he will send no one to hell. There is a heaven and there is a hell. God sends no one to hell. He gives people a choice. And when they reject Jesus Christ, they choose hell. And that's where they get to go if they continue to reject Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. They also say, okay, if there is a heaven, ultimately everybody will end up there anyway because we're all God's children. We are not all God's children. We are all God's creation. And the gospel lets us know how we become a child of God. We all were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Since the beginning of time, 
man had a relationship with God and he rebelled and he has been rebelling ever since and falling into sin. And it was that sin, that rebellion, that rejection of obeying what God says that caused men to be separated from him. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about restoring man's relationship to God. Back in Deuteronomy 29, 4, Moses tells us that the Lord had not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear. God promised later through the prophets that he would give man a new heart. God wants us to know and to love him and love for God is equated with obedience. He promised in Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 that when we're born again, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we could receive the righteousness that God would give us through Christ, that he would give us a new heart to be able to perceive eyes to see and ears to hear. And so based on that promise, we become children of God or new creations in Christ Jesus. In John chapter three, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said to Nicodemus, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked the question, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus answered, I say unto you, except a man be born of water. First Peter 1, 23 and 25 tells us being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible word of God, which lives and abides forever. He tells us our flesh is like grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Ephesians 5, 25b and 26 says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So it is the water of the word of God as a mother has brings her baby into the water, into the world, her water breaks and that baby is born. We are born again when the word of God breaks into and has an effect upon our hearts. He said, not only are we born by water, but and the spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, ye are not in the flesh if you're born again, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is a creation of God, but he is not a child of God. He let us know that we can flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is why we must be born again in our spirit man. We are more than flesh. This part that you cannot see, I cannot see, is the breathing part, the soul of man. He said that which is born of flesh is flesh, this outward appearance. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. That's the spiritual birth. That's when you come to believe that God sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We learn that the outer man is decaying, but our spirit man in Christ is being renewed day by day. In order for faith to come, 
people must hear the word of God preached and taught. Jesus says in John 16, 7 through 11, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he convicts and convinces people of three things, of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Jesus says he will convict or convince us because you have not believed in the Son of God. Remember, again, God does not send people to hell. When they have heard the gospel and reject it, they refuse God's offer of salvation or safety. He says the Holy Spirit will convict or convince of righteousness. God has a righteous standard and everyone has failed, has fallen short of his glorious standard. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So just in case you thought you were the only one, God says, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. We were not seeking God. God sought us. He said, all are gone out of the way and become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Any good that we do, it is because of the Holy Spirit of God in our born again spirit that has turned us from sin and darkness. He says he also convicts us of judgment. And I just want to acknowledge, I see my granddaughter's on. Good evening. Glad to have you, sweetie. He says of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Satan has been judged. When Jesus went to that cross and paid our sins, that debt that we owed, Satan can no longer hold over our heads. In Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, convicted of judgment, it is said, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ came, he who knew no sin, offered himself up to pay our sins, which were many. And when he returns, the second coming that we are talking about, it will not be about sin and salvation. He will be coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's already dealt with sin on the cross. In John 6, 63, Jesus reminds us that the, it is the spirit that is quickened or comes alive. Our flesh profits nothing. We came from the dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, but our spirit is eternal. And later we'll get those new bodies, the ultimate, the creme de la creme of our salvation. So we are born again by the word of God. And that is how we become sons or daughters of the true and living God. At the rapture, he's coming to deliver our bodies from this body of death. He will reunite our purified souls and bring both into glory. By way of review, we said salvation is past, it's present, and it is future. It is past because our sins have been judged. There is therefore now no condemnation for each of us who are in Christ Jesus. His empty tomb that held him for three days is now for all who believe the permanent burial ground for sin, guilt, weakness, shame, and unbelief. Our salvation is as well present, meaning sanctification. The first one, the past was justification. The present is sanctification. 
He tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body, preserve us blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. God is the sanctifier. The Holy Spirit is in us, convicting us of selfishness and sin so that when we do sin, that is not our lifestyle. Occasionally we will sin. He will convict us so that we can confess, repent, renounce it, go and sin that sin no more. Believers are the ones that are confessing their sins. Sinners do not confess sin. They do what they do. They sin until they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is future as well. That is called glorification. From before the foundation of the world, God chose us to conform us and transform us into the image of his dear son. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 says our conversation or our lifestyle is in heaven. We have a dual citizenship. We are citizens of earth and we are citizens of heaven. We are in a foreign land. Heaven is our true home. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says that we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And to that we should say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Peter is saying again that Paul's epistles, some of these things are hard to be understood because of the weakness of man's mind. But for us who are born again, who have the mind of Christ, who have the Holy Spirit, the intelligence of God, we can hear and perceive in our under, in our hearts and understand and see God at work in us, through us, and around us. Whereas unbelievers can't because they have not been born again. They do not have the Holy Spirit who enables us to perceive all of these things. John 6, 45, Jesus said, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the father cometh unto me. We come unto him and get into his word on a daily basis to learn of him, to sit at his feet. He told us in Mark 4, 11, Jesus said unto them, unto us, the born again, it is given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And I love that verse. And I can always remember where it is because it's the 411. It's information. And he says, the mystery of God's kingdom, it has been given to us to know and to understand. And the Holy Spirit enables us to do that. Jesus said, but to them that are without, to those who are not born again, because they have not placed their faith in Christ, they do not have the Holy Spirit. And so all of these things, as, D as Jesus teaches in parables, they don't get it. But to the born again, we might be a little slow of heart, but we get it. The spirit of God teaches us the things that God has freely given to us. That is uh, verified over in First Corinthians 2 verses 12 and 13. He says, now you and I, the born again, have not received the spirit of the world 
but we have received the spirit of God that we might know the things that are freely given unto us, which things also we speak not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. He says, but the natural man, the unbelieving man, he doesn't receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. So to many, the second coming of Christ, they didn't believe his first coming. So they're not going to believe the second coming is foolishness to them. They said back earlier in second Peter, he says, they say everything remains just as it was. But they are willfully ignorant that God destroyed the world the first time by water. And so the Holy Spirit comes, teaches us all things and brings to our remembrance the things that Christ has said to us, has taught us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Jesus defeated our last fear. And that fear was the fear of death. He went into the grave. He came out. He conquered it. And when we die, we will not remain in the grave. We will hear his voice and he will raise us again and take us home to be with him. You and I, I'm spending, God is having me spend a lot of time to reiterate. If you are born again, you can understand the things of God because the Holy Spirit will teach you when you sit before the Lord, open up his word and pray, Lord, help me to understand and to see what you want me to see. In 1 John 2, verses 20 through 24, he tells us, we have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And you're saying, I, I don't know all things. You have the knower in you, the Spirit of God. So you know all things when you need to know what you need to know because the Holy Spirit will explain it to you and help you understand it. And so he lets us know uh, the spirit of God abides in you. In 1 John 2, 27, the unction or the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which you have received of him, abides in you. And you need not that any man teach you. And what he's saying, even though you have pastors and teachers and preachers, we are not your teacher in the ultimate sense. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can give you the understanding. We teach in order so that you can gain understanding and to meditate on the word of God. And as you meditate, think long, ask questions. Lord, how should I apply this to my life? The Holy Spirit teaches you all of those things. He is your teacher. He leads you into all truth. It was the Holy Spirit who convicted us of our sin. It was the Holy Spirit who convinced us that salvation is by faith in the finished work of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who converted us, caused us to be born again when we heard and believed the testimony of God about his son. It is the Holy Spirit who daily instructs us when we take his yoke upon him learn of him and follow him. So that is why Jesus was telling Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes and the Holy Spirit moves on whomever God chooses to draw out of darkness into his marvelous light, causing him to be convicted of sin 
convinced that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we need to accept his plan of salvation by placing faith in his son. John 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, meaning Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but by the will of God. This is why the word of God is to be paramount in a believer's life. It becomes a delight for us to sit at his feet and learn of him. We are born again by the word of God. We are transformed by the word of God. We are kept by the word of God. As we meditate, study, pray, listen to the word preached and taught, we are not unstable. We are kept secure from misunderstanding and misapplying any part of God's word. The Holy Spirit God's divine power will instruct us and establish us in divine truth. He will keep us from falling into undetected and subtle errors like those who are ignorant and unstable of God's holiness and justice and will eventually, if they do not turn to the truth of God's word, end up in utter ruin. Peter is saying people without Christ, they're unstable because they're unwilling to trust him as savior and submit to his lordship and be instructed in the truth. So they wrestle with the word of God, trying to make the scriptures say what the Holy Ghost is not saying. In Revelations 22, 18 and 19, Jesus says, I testify unto every man that hears the words of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written therein. You don't tamper with the word of God. God said what he said. He meant what he said. I want to encourage you to remember two verses. These were life-changing verses for me. Isaiah 50 verses 4 and 5. The Lord had given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the Lord, the learned. The Lord had opened mine ear and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. This is Jesus speaking. That this is what God has done. We are children of God and we are to follow the example of Christ. God wakens us up every morning and we should get in his face, get in his word and allow him to speak to us, sit at his feet and learn of him. The second verse is Proverbs 28, 9. And it says, he that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. God is saying, if I touch you and wake you up in the morning and you do not honor me by sitting at my feet, opening your ear to hear your God speak with you. Your prayer is an abomination. If you can't listen to me, who knows all, why should I answer your prayer? Let us therefore earnestly pray for the spirit of God to instruct us 
God, if you wake up and that is not the start of your day, beginning with prayer, thanking God for opening your eyes, putting your feet on the floor, going to the potty, doing whatever you need to do and establishing your day at the beginning of the day. The psalmist said, early in the morning will I seek thee. When we get into the bark, the book of Mark, Jesus rose up early and went to sit and be taught of the Father. We're going to look briefly at verse 17. He says, Ye therefore, beloved, again, that's you and I, you know these things before. And so he's saying, now that you know that Christ is going to return, receive you unto himself, he wants us to eagerly be waiting for him. We know that he is going to prepare a place for us who are a prepared people. He says, I'm putting you in remembrance of all these things so that you are not led astray by the error of the wicked and that you do not stall, uh, fall from your own steadfastness. Be ye steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for your labor is not in vain. Peter wrote at the very beginning of the book, he said, this letter is written to them that have ob obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And because we have received everything pertaining to life and godliness, he encourages us to continue to add to our faith, to always hope, and for us as Christians to endure unto the end. I see it's 742. We will pick up next week at verse 18. I trust that your heart has been encouraged, that you are challenged, and that you will not look around at the world and allow it to make you fearful. Absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. He gives us grace each day to be able to endure and to share him with others along the way. Father God, we come as we are nearing the close of Second Peter. We thank you for giving us the heads up. We know the end of the story. History is your story. It's history. And so, Lord, it has already been lived out before you who are eternal. We are on the timeline, and the timeline is your timeline, and you are long-suffering, giving us as Christians opportunity to bring many to the saving knowledge of you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to be about your business, living a life that is pleasing to you, and that causes others to ask the reason for the hope that is in us as they look around the world and feel hopeless. We are not a people without hope. You are the God of hope. You fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we can abound in hope and we stand on tiptoe awaiting the day that you return, not fearing this life, but filled with hope for the new heaven and the new earth to come. And in the meantime, understanding that you've given us all things richly to enjoy here and now, for in your presence is fullness of joy. I pray, Lord, that we continue to study and show ourselves approved unto you so that we are not workmen who are ashamed, who are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but that we remain steadfast in the truth established with our feet in your word and you ordering our steps. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Uh, continue to go back if you can and read through First, uh, Second Peter. It should have a greater meaning, greater understanding, and give you greater joy as you have a preview of things to come. God bless you. Until next week, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks to you as well on the conference line. Have a great weekend.